Well, greetings everyone, and may I say what a great joy it is to join with you in worship this morning. And uh, I invite you to gather around God's Word, and let's go forward now as we appreciate and study and really inculcate His Word. Hear now the call to worship, and it comes from Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Join with me now as we sing our first hymn, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this version. Let's sing Praise to the Lord. Join with me now as we come before God in an attitude of prayer. Almighty, eternal God in heaven, we bow our heads before you because you are God Almighty and this is the right thing to do. We bow before you and we bring our worship and our praise to you for this is also the right thing to do. We commit ourselves to worshipping you as God, all-powerful, omnipotent. We thank you, Father, for the knowledge that we have of you. We thank you, Father, that we can come before you and praise and worship you. And yet, in this attitude of prayer, we confess that we don't always 
observe this attitude and keep this attitude foremost in our minds. We are not always keeping our eyes and focus on you, and we wander off and go our own ways and trust in our own strengths. And for that, Lord, in this quiet moment now, we repent sincerely, ask for your forgiveness and your grace and mercy to bring us back to constantly walk with you on the narrow path and to keep our eyes focused entirely on you. We lift our voices to you now in an attitude of prayer to thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for all that you do for us. Much of what you do for us goes unnoticed. We don't even notice all that you do. We don't always appreciate all that you do. But in this quiet moment now, we want to thank you very, very much for all that you do for us even though we are obviously blissfully aware many times of all that you do for us, we thank you now from the bottom of our hearts for all. We turn our minds now to those known and loved by us. We thank you for the fact that we can come before you. It was Jesus who told us, that we could come before you and bring our prayers and petitions to you. And we do that now for the people that we know and love. People are either suffering from illness or difficulties of a variety of different types and kinds. We lift their names to you now, Almighty God, and we pray for them asking that you lay your powerful hands on the illness and heal it, that you bring peace and contentment to those who are struggling with difficulties, you bring resolution to the complex and complicated issues that people have in their lives, be it familial, employment, financial, domestic. We ask you, Lord, to intervene and bring your resolution to those situations. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who when the disciples turned to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he answered, pray like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not into too temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let's join together now in our second hymn. And the words of this hymn will become clear as we go into the message. The hymn is, Thanks God, Whose Word Was Spoken.
At this time of the year, we are approaching bringing Jesus very much into our focus. At this time of the year, Jesus becomes right in front of us in every way. We can't turn around when we are not reminded somewhere, shopping malls, down the road with decorations, that this is the time where Jesus is our main focus. Now the Bible, God's profound and perfect word, speaks a lot about the person of Jesus in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, but none more powerfully than the opening words of the Gospel of John, where it's curious to note his name is not even mentioned. In the verses of John 1, the verses 1 to 14, Jesus is spoken of in almost every line. But we're going to today read only one verse, and we will study Jesus in that one verse. And I'm hoping that <clears throat> after we've read this verse and had a good look at it, Jesus will become very, very much in your focus. <coughs> Let's read it together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the words was God. If you are ever approached by a group of Jehovah's Witnesses, ask them to quote you John 1.1. 1, 1. And you'll be astonished to hear them read exactly the same words as we have just read, with one exception. Their so-called Bible has the last phrase as, and the word was, a God, with a small g. This major error will become clearer as we progress in this message. We start by asking ourselves, in the beginning of what? Well, let's go to Genesis 1.1. And there we find, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And again we ask, in the beginning of what? Well, quite simply, <clears throat> and here it is, in the beginning of time, the beginning of what could be measured the beginning of cosmic bodies moving in set patterns that repeat themselves in perfect time frames. In the beginning, so says the world-renowned astronomer and astrophysicist Dr. David Bloch, and I quote, The Big Bang represents an interval of time in the early history of the universe when matter everywhere, at all points, was concentrated at immense densities and temperatures. In the beginning, says Dr. David Bloch, the present outward moving galaxies contracting at all points in the universe, he writes, the Big Bang epoch marks the beginning of time. And there it is. The ancient physicist Augustine argued that time was God created and before heaven and earth was made, there was no time. Philo, the first century Jewish scholar, wrote, Time began either simultaneously with the world or after it, and time is a measured space determined by the world's movement. He goes on to say, Time itself is determined by the motion of objects. And so, in the beginning, God starts the entire universe in motion. And as such, we can measure their motion and set time intervals. But note, someone was with God at that time. Yes, it was a person. Now, let's go back to our scripture today. In the beginning was the Word. Now, look at this. This whole quote is all about the word, not a word, the word. And this word, the word, was with God. 
In the beginning, <coughs> the Greek for with, pros, indicates a close face-to-face -face relationship. Austin tells of his friend Simplicius, saying that these words should be written in gold. The one who is being spoken of here is a person and is called the Word. In the ancient Greek, we find it as ho logos, which is a title. And this idiom is peculiar to John's gospel and can be divided into two meanings. Logos in diathetos, the word is conceived, and logos proforikos, the word uttered. So the word logos means the expression of a thought, the embodiment of an idea or concept. And therefore, his relationship is to the Godhead, not mere company, but the most intimate communion. Remember, it was face to face, and it incorporates Jesus in his super infinite divinity, his deity, his creative power, and his incarnation. These, or this, is the thought of God in word. And to really grasp this, we need to return to Genesis 1. Have you ever noticed that when God created the world and the universe, he used words? Let me explain. Look at how it goes. And God said, let there be light. And there we have it. An idea becomes reality through words. <clears throat> and now we're at a place where the word is with God in the beginning. If we look at verse 2, we see he was already with God in the beginning. <clears throat> Jesus then was with God even before the beginning. But more than that, the word Logos is Jesus. And look at it. And here it comes. This is immensely powerful. And as we <clears throat> enter into the season where Jesus becomes our main focus, this we must remember. The Word was God. And it is through Jesus, in the form of Jesus as a man, that God speaks to us. The Son of God, God was his Father. God created him as human and therefore he is the Son of God. In Matthew 17, 5, we find Jesus is up a high mountain with Peter, James, and John, and was transfigured, and God speaks to the three, and he says, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Look at this. Listen to him. Here is the eternal mind focused on the word. And the Word, of course, is Jesus. The Word in human form. Word, the most natural indication of God's mind. And it is made known to us through Jesus. <coughs> if we look at Hebrews 1, 2, we find these words. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Jesus existed with God in the beginning, and always before the beginning, and always the Word was in the beginning with God, and the Word was God when the beginning began. There are so many variations of this phrase, but we focus on just this. Jesus is, was, and always will be God himself. You don't accept Jesus, you reject God. So when Jesus speaks, we must listen. What he says should be everything to us, and we should pay close attention to everything that Jesus says. Jesus holds the mystery of man's redemption and reconciliation with God in his words. So when we read what Jesus said in John 14, 6, for example, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, 
We must note these words and study these words as they are vital to our personal salvation. Matthew Henry in his great commentary says this, There was a glory and happiness which Christ had with God before the world was. He goes further and writes, The mystery of man's redemption by his word incarnate was hid in God before all the worlds began. Finally, Matthew Henry puts it this way. He was with God and therefore came forth from God. Suddenly, Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 23 makes a lot more sense. And I quote, The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. John the Baptist was the voice, but Jesus is the word. And being the word, he is the absolute truth. And he is also the full and faithful witness of the mind of God. To close, the purpose of these opening sentences of the Gospel of John is to confirm our faith in Jesus as to who he is to show us God's true Messiah, the Savior of all, who will turn to him and claim him as their personal Savior, so that we may receive him and rely on him and be ruled by him. These few words in the opening sentences of John show us the perfection of Jesus and opens the door to heaven to those of us who will believe it. Amen. Let's now join together and sing our closing hymn, and I think you're going to enjoy this version, so please feel free to sing along with the words, Lord of Creation. Your love. 
love to inspire me, your counsel to guide, your presence to shield me, whatever be tied. Lord of all being, I give you my all. If I should disown you, I stumble and fall. But let in your service your words to obey. I'll walk in your freedom to the end of the Let's close our service of worship this morning with a benediction, and it comes from James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Amen.